great. I'm so glad the Savior reached down for you and for me. Came down. Have your Bibles open to Esther chapter number 7. Esther chapter number 7. Again, welcome. So glad to see you here. And those who have joined us online, a welcome to you as well. If you're here in the auditorium, you have a cell phone, if you wouldn't mind putting it on silent. Last few services, we seem to have a cell phone go off randomly. And so if you'd help us with that, just make sure that's on silent when you come in. Now saying that, I did double check mine before I came up here. Back when cell phones first came out, there was a few of us, a few of us who tried to catch someone else with a cell phone on. And uh, to kind of make sure it was off. But now, now some of you are going to try that, but it's, it's silent over there. It'll just buzz away. You help us with that, that would be tremendous. Esther chapter 7, as we continue in the, the account of Esther. What was going on in Shushan, in Persia? It was the fact that there was opposition to God's people, to the Jews. Not everyone liked the people of God. Not everyone wanted them to succeed. In fact, as you know, as we've preached on and looked at, Haman, the villain in this story, Haman, who still to this day, when the Jews um, celebrate this feast, that when Haman's name is said, they will make noisemakers or spit and hiss at his name. Haman wanted to destroy the Jews. In fact, he convinced King Ahasuerus to, to have, give him permission to sign a decree that all the Jews could be destroyed on a certain day. Opposition was faced. In Esther chapter 7, we've now gone to one banquet. We're now at the second banquet. Haman, last week we looked at, of course, has led Mordecai around. And he had to give Mordecai honor when really Haman wanted to kill him. And now we come to the second feast. The second banquet. Esther chapter 7, verse number 1. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. This is the third time that King Ahasuerus has asked Esther this particular question. The very first time was when Esther went before the king and extended his golden scepter. Remember, that was preceded by three days of fasting and prayer. At that time when he said, what's your request, what's your petition, I'll grant you up to half of the kingdom. Oh, 120 or so provinces under his control at that time. The ruling leader of the world at that time. And Esther, upon request, could have had half of it. Her first petition, would you come to a banquet? They came to that first banquet that she had prepared and King Ahasuerus asked the question again at that banquet. Esther, what is thy request? What is thy petition? He wasn't a dumb guy. He knew that she did not risk her life just so he'd go to a banquet with her. He asked her again at that time. She said, would you come back one more time? Here they are, the second banquet, the third request. Now Esther is going to state what is really on her heart. What caused her to risk her life. To risk her comfort to risk everything that she had, everything that she was, to risk for this request right here. Verse number 3, Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. What she basically says is, King, if in any way, shape, or form, if you have any delight in me, if you, if you have any love, any affection for me, would you just... Let me live. Now imagine your king has rears at this point. You've asked this question three times. You know that you've not gotten a straight answer yet. Now I've been married. I'm still married. Hopefully I'm married after this sermon. But sometimes, ladies, when us men ask a question, you beat around the bush a little bit. We're not really good at clues too often. All right, so ladies, sometimes you have to spell it out for us. And you ladies know what I'm talking about. You men know exactly what I'm saying. All right. Just say what you want and want what you say. It's okay. You can tell us. All right. And, but King Hazarius, he felt like she's beat around the bush a little bit because she has here. All right. And she says, well, what I'm asking for is my life. He obviously has favor toward his wife, toward the queen. He extended the scepter the first time. He went to the first banquet. He's gone to the second banquet. He obviously is going to let her live. She goes on and Verse number four, for we are sold. We are sold, I and my people, to be de destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, 
I held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king has a rear answer and said to Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? The king is not happy. Who would think to destroy the life of my beautiful bride, my queen? Who would even dare to presume that that would be okay to sell my wife for death and all her people for death? Where is this man? Where is this villain? Where is this enemy? Well, funny you should ask, King. <laughs> That's weird. I think I found him. She says that in verse 6. And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. The Bible is the often the book of understatements. It says something that if you stop and think is seriously misunderstood by us. Then Haman, you can kind of see it in my mind's eye at least, I can kind of see as, as Esther is beginning to pour out her heart. No doubt at this point the king understood this was a real request. And she begins to speak and the, and the emotion and the passion. I'm sold and I'm to be destroyed and to slain. And if I had just been sold for a bond man or a bond woman, I would have held my tongue. And you can kind of see the king, kind of like maybe the steam beginning to rise from his toes. Maybe the color of his cheeks begin to turn red. And you have to wonder what Haman was thinking this whole time. Do you not? As, remember, it was just him and the king and queen, right? Remember, he went home and told everybody, it's just me and the king and queen. And, and now, it's just him and the king and queen. <laughs> My, how the tables turn. Can you imagine the fear and dread as he heard this conversation, I believe, taking place? As he began to understand, as the other shoe was now being dropped, the shoe the night before, I have to take Mordecai around the city, and now the other shoe being dropped. Can you imagine the fear and dread the Bible says this, And the king, arising, verse 7, from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. <laughs> yes, Haman, there is evil determined towards you. Yes, Haman, you were number two, but now you're not. Haman, you were the golden child, but you ain't the golden child, but you ain't the golden boy no more, Haman. Haman, you thought life was great. You thought life was grand, but life has taken a twist for you. This morning, with God's help, I'm going to tell the message, the good guys finish last. The good guys finish last. We can read this and we can be happy for Esther, happy for the Jews, excited for what God is doing in this particular account. Do you ever wonder if in 2020, if God still works that way? You ever wonder if God's still in control, if He's still doing these kind of... Is he, do, do good guys now finish last? Why does it feel sometimes like the good guys finish last? Though we read in the Bible that that's not the case. Right? Why does it feel as we look around that good guys finish last? Why does it feel like right now that righteousness and goodness is being silenced and evil is being promoted? Why does it feel that way? That's what happened the first six and six and a half chapters, six and a half chapters of Esther. Evil was triumphing and good and righteousness was being squashed. You ever feel that way in 2020? Seems you can't, you can't even support what is right without backlash. You can't define marriage from the Bible without backlash. You can't say that marriage is between a man and a woman the way God created it. You can't say that without backlash. Can you not see that? Can you not see that you can't support what is right? You can't support law and order without backlash. You can't define life from the Bible without backlash. And in case you're wondering, I still vote pro-life. That is still an issue. Killing an unborn child is still murder in God's economy. I don't care what economy you're in or you're thinking about. It is still murder. And that is still a huge problem in God's economy. If you doubt it, read the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. 
Well, Pastor, you understand this person, they're pro-choice, but the other things I line up with. Oh, that's okay. They just like to murder people. So they're a good person. It, but you say that and there's backlash. Is there not? Have you not been on the news? Have you not been on social media? Righteousness and goodness seems to be being silenced. Churches in America facing opposition in America like we've never seen before. Now, there are some who now, well, well, just go to China, go to Iran, go to Iraq. They face different... Yes, but we're not in China. We're not in Iran. We're not in Iraq. We're in America. All right, we'll pray for them, but I have to operate here. That's where God's called us and called me to be here. Opposition in America, like we mentioned this morning, in California, executive orders and edicts declaring that meeting in a church will result in your power and water being turned off. $1,000 fines per day for the pastor and every member who showed up filed for John Doe and Jane Doe. Well, that's interesting, John Doe and Jane Doe. Not a whole lot of different genders. It'll sink in. <laughs> Threats that meeting in church is a public health risk. In church. Satan's having a heyday. Satan is having a heyday. It seems like good is being silenced and evil is triumphing. The good guys have to finish last now. I know, Pastor, it happened in Esther and Haman. Boy, that was awesome. That was great. That's exciting. I just don't see it right now. I just don't see it right now. There's attacks from without. There's attacks from within. Other Christians attack other Christians. There's some churches now I read about recently. They're saying, offerings are so good, we're not going to meet in person again. They don't know a thing about church. This is not just a fund ra fundraising campaign. It's about God's kingdom. Let me say it again. This is not just a fundraising campaign. It's about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Of course, we give. We have offering. We'll take one in the service. Don't worry. All right. But you don't know a thing about church if you're changing your church just so you get more money. You're a charlatan. You're a hypocrite. You are a hireling. This is just about money. There are people who are Christians who are lambasting our friends in California for opening up church. Now listen, some people will not come, and, and that's okay. I, I told you that. Feel no pressure from me. But we're going to have church here. You're, you're allowed to come. You can come to church here. All right. But a Christian that says, well, you cannot open up church because if you open up church, you obviously don't care about people. What's interesting is that the same reason that they're giving for not opening up church is one of the reasons that we will open up church because we care about people. We care about souls. We care about the gospel. Beyond that, we care about fellow Christians and about the commands from God. The, the same thing. It seems sometimes like good is squelched. If you would, turn over to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. In this particular account in Esther chapter 7, we see that God knows them that are His. In Psalm chapter 73, the psalmist presents a problem and a solution along these lines. Begins, truly God is good to Israel even to such as, as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plague like other men. Therefore pride compass them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. 
to give you a few thoughts about the good guys still finish second this morning. Because if we're not careful, we'll be in the same spot as Asaph, the writer of this psalm. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the heathen, why, why do they go? And a few thoughts for us this morning to kind of turn our direction and turn our minds. I see in the psalm that they're in a bad place. There's a bad place. Verse number two, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. The, the psalm writer, the writer of the psalm is saying, listen, I wasn't in a good place. I, I wasn't in a good thought process. I wasn't looking good. I'm to my wit's end. It seems like the only place to go is up. I was discouraged. I was depressed and I was down. Nothing was good. It was all bad. Nothing looked great. It was all bleak. Nothing was golden. It all looked black as the night. You ever been to a bad spot? Right now, it seems like it is easier to get there with this mindset. Are we ever going to see the light of day? Will we ever see any good things again? Why does it seem like we're in such a bad place? I read a silly story about Melvin. After a tough and discouraging day, he plopped himself on the couch and began wallowing in self pity. He moaned to his wife. Uh, nobody cares about me. In fact, the whole world hates me. Without looking up from her work, his wife replied, Well, that's not true, honey. The whole world couldn't possibly hate you. Because the fact is, most of them don't even know you. Sometimes we're in a bad place, aren't we, though? Sometimes everything you turn on, everything you read, is dark, dim, and gloomy. Welcome to the news. Just understand, the news is in a business to get you to watch them and to read them. So the greater effect they can have on you on their titles, the clickbait, the quicker and the faster you'll see what they're saying. The news is not here as a service to you. The news is an industry. They're trying to make money. How do they make money? Viewers, clicks, reads. So what will they say? The storm of the century. It's amazing. I've lived through like six storms of the century now. And I'm only 40. Snowfall. Make sure you're prepared. And the shelves at Kroger are just being slammed. Running out of toilet paper, question mark. What do you do? You run to your bathroom and start counting the rolls. Killer hornets. <laughs> do they kill things? Sure. So does snakes. So does my cat at home. It kills mice. Killer cat found in the Howell property. <laughs> right? Yeah. This, is, this is what news does. All right, just don't miss this when you turn on the television. They, they want you to watch after the commercial break. So they say something startling to you. Like, whoa, 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 I got to sit down. I got to keep on watching this. You're on Facebook. You're on your phone. Pops up. Boom. I'm not saying there's not bad things happening, but you can real quick get in a bad place. Will could get in a bad place. The writer of this psalm was in a bad place. A bad place because he looked around and it looked like good guys just finished last. It looks like no matter what I do, I'm trying to live for God. It doesn't matter what decisions I make. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's worthless. Because all my, my time I spend in church, I'm in church on Sundays and on Tuesdays. And, and look at them having a good time. Look at that big boat. Look at that big, look at the big house they have. And, and look at me, I'm just suffering for Jesus. In a bad place. He had, if I can, second of all, a bad perspective. Verses 3 to 11. He measured others' prosperity. That's what the verse says in verse number 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. In Bible times, food was not as readily available as it is now, and often a sign of wealth was someone being overweight. What he's saying is, they're so wealthy, their eyes are bulging out. They are so fat. They have need of nothing. Whatever they want, they can have. He measured their prosperity, and he found himself to be wanting. They have the boat. They have the car. They've got it easy. And poor little old me. Good guy finishing last. It's all right. I'll go to church today. It's all right. He measured other, others' problems. Verses 4 and 5 and 6. There are no bands in their death. They die easily. Their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. They're not plagued like other men. 
They, they, have, they have no issues in life. They have no problems in life. You see the wrong perspective? You see that? We know that's not true. We know it's not true. But sometimes we're in a bad place. Our perspective ends up in a bad place as well. They don't have any problems. Look at that. Everything's going easy peasy for them. They keep on winning. I keep on losing. Their edicts and their executive orders stand. All of ours fail. Good guys are finishing last. And it was different in Esther's day, but it's different today. And boy, a bad perspective. They measure others' prominence. Boy, this is, seems to be true in 2020. They are corrupt, verse number 8, and speak Wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily. Verse 9, they set their mouth against their heaven, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Everything that they say seems to flood through the earth, all right? All the wickedness floods through the earth, and the good and the truth is squashed. So those verses are saying. He measures their prominence and says, listen, I don't even have a voice. It seems like wickedness and, and, and these bad people who don't love God, who don't have righteousness in their heart, who don't have the Spirit of God in their life, everything that they say gets exalted and retweeted and, and, and reset, and everything that I say gets squashed, gets censored, gets wrung out. You don't have to look very far to see that happens in 2020. They can say what they want, they can do what they want, they can treat people how they want. But what happens when we're in a bad place with a bad perspective is our priorities get out of whack. When we're in a bad place with a bad perspective, our priorities get in a bad place. Look at it, if you would, please. Verse number 12. Behold, these are ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He was focused on I. I've done this. I've tried hard. I've cleansed my hands in vain. I've prospered. I, I've worked every day. I'm, I'm at wit's end. I've done everything I can to do and it's come up short. Everything I do is worthless. Can, can you hear the pity party right there? Oh, we're good at pity parties, aren't we? Come on now, can I get an amen? We're good at pity parties. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. Come on now, Christian. You're not, you're not immune from that, from that disease. We all have that inside of us without the Spirit of God. We can all be there really quick, can't we? Oh, woe is me. That's what he's saying. He was focused on I. I don't have what others have. I've wasted my time. I have it harder than anyone else. That's verse 14. For all the day... Have I been plagued and chastened every morning? I have it worse than anyone else. Oh, if I had a dollar. If I had a dollar. Oh, you don't understand how bad I've got it. Oh, you think you've got it bad. I've got it worse. We've got that inside of us that can only be conquered by the Spirit of God. It'll happen sometimes here at church. Some will come in with an injury. Years ago, it was one of our young ladies. She had hurt her leg. She was on crutches. One of our teenagers. I said, well, listen. I said, as you go around church today, this Sunday, I said, do me a favor. I said, would you count for me how many times people ask what happened? And then before you can even tell your story, they go into how it was bad for them. Sure, they will, Pastor Howell. She came back that Sunday morning. Guilty as charged, congregation. Eight or nine times, she said. I don't remember exactly. Eight or nine, to eight or nine times that some of you said, hey, what happened? And before she could say anything, you told how bad it was for you. That's what this guy's saying. All the day long have I been plagued. It is bad in my life. I don't care how, how bad you have it. I have it worse. It's like a hunting story turned around backwards. Like a fishing story that's gone wrong. You've got problems. No, I've got bigger problems. A little competition, that's what he says. It's a bad priority. Someone said it this way. Never attempt to bear more than one kind of trouble at once. Some people bear three kinds. All they've had, all they have now, and all they expect to have. Come on now. They bear all they've had in the past, all they have right now, and all they expect to have at the same time. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We're not made to worry about tomorrow or worry about yesterday. We're made to worry about today with God's help. And then my Bible says, be careful for nothing. 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known. He's in a bad place. Bad thoughts, bad perspective, bad priorities. Verse 17, it changes. Where the writer says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. There is some question about what he means by this. But I know this. He went into a changed place. He went into a changed place. Perhaps he walked into the temple and heard from God, called the sanctuary of God. I don't know about you, but I like coming to church. I'm encouraged when I come to church. I'm glad to hear from God when I come to church. I've been thrilled with our Tuesday night speakers. It seems like every week God has brought something, exactly what we needed it seems like, and just building upon it, tremendous Some of you know what I mean, that you've been in a bad place with a bad perspective, with bad priorities, and you come to church and God speaks to you at church. And you hear from God and you leave with your load lightened. Why? Because God touched you until I went to the sanctuary of God. You were hurting and confused and conflicted and concerned, but you came to worship God. The songs lifted your soul. The Word of God illuminated your thoughts. And the, and the Spirit of God lifted and lightened your load. This is why, one reason why going to church is so important. Until I came into the sanctuary of God. And some of you know exactly what I'm referring to. You came in those back doors, those side doors, and your heart was heavy. And your heart was, was hard, perhaps. And God spoke to you. It could have been in a song. And we've had some tremendous music. It could have been in a sermon. We've had some of those. Your panic-stricken mind became peace-filled mind. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, I love coming in the back doors and I see smiling faces here at First Baptist Church. So many of you encourage me. Hi, Pastor. It's great to see you at church. I say, hi, church. It's great to see you at church. I'm encouraged by those who join us online. I'm encouraged to be in church. I'm encouraged to see the choir, hear the orchestra. I'm encouraged to see folks who want to worship God. I'm encouraged in the sanctuary of God. He was in a changed place. You see, you won't get changed by staying in the same bad place you have been. It could have been the sanctuary of God, the temple. It could have been in some personal worship time with God. See, we also can approach God ourselves. And there's been those times when I've been in a bad place. My mind's going wonky. It seems like good is being squashed and evil is triumphing. And you get along with God and God himself, through the Spirit of God and the Word of God, touches your heart. The sanctuary, my sanctuary. I'm the temple of God. And some of the rest of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been there. You know exactly what it, when God spoke to you. Just you and him in alone time creator of the universe speaks. I remember one night years ago now, I had a bad attitude. Confession's good for the soul, is it not? Don't look at me like I'm some pagan. Most of you have had a bad attitude some time in your life as well. Began to read my Bible. Read the first chapter. Turn that page. Probably almost ripped it out of God's word. If turn it so hard. Read the next chapter. Still had a bad attitude. Read the next chapter, so a bad attitude. Thirteen chapters later, it took. I say, Pastor, you're in a bad place. You're right, I was. You're right, I was. But I changed my place. I went to God. And it took him 13 chapters because I'm, I'm kind of stubborn. You may not know that. But you won't get changed staying in the same bad place you have been. You won't. And that's what the psalmist says, until, until, until I went to the sanctuary of God. He had a changed place. He had a change perspective. Verses 18 and following. He saw a true measure of prosperity. The first part of the, the chapter, he said, I saw what they had, I saw what they did, and I thought, that's prosperous. But, but I see now that it was a different measure of prosperity because really in verse 18, God, you set them in slippery places. You've cast them down to destruction. They're brought into desolation as in a moment, and they are utterly consumed with terrors. In a sense, what he's saying is, over desolation they stand with one foot there and the other foot on a banana peel. He says, I've seen now what you're doing. 
I've understood that, that God really has allowed the foolish to stand on thin ice. Oh, you Michiganders, you know ice. You know ice. The treadways get to learn ice. Black ice, some of them know some ice. Years we've had faculty come from California. Some of them had had the wonderful occasion to drive on snow for the first time being from California. And learn that snow is slick. And snow covers ice. And ice, snow, and a vehicle of 50 don't mix. The psalmist says, I realize what their prosperity was. It was just black ice. And they may appear to be standing, but they're going to wipe out in a moment. In a moment, they'll be brought to the desolation. You remember Haman? Remember where we started? Esther chapter 7, here he is. Did I mention he was the king, with the king and the queen? Did I mention that? Here he is. He appeared to be prospering. He appeared to be prominent. And he appeared to be plague-free. But really, he was just standing on thin ice. In a moment, as long as it took Esther to say those few words, 15 seconds or less, that ice, whoo, and there he goes. The good guys still finish last? Nope, they don't. I see last of all in this verse, the very last verse of this chapter. I think the key, change priority. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God. See what he says? I came to the sanctuary. I got to change perspective. And what happened? I changed my priority. Before, it was all about me. I've worked hard. I have all the problems. And it's a terrible mess. Now, he says, but I have put my trust in God. That's our theme for this year. I believe God. Say that with me. I believe God. When you believe God and put your trust in God, then everything else will work out. If you're in a bad place with a bad perspective and bad priorities, change your place, which will change your perspective, and it will bring change priorities. Why does it appear sometimes? Bad guys win. That's for a little while. They're on top. But they're just on thin ice. There was a traveler, a story told about him, who fell into a deep pit and couldn't get out. Several persons came along and saw him struggling in the pit. The sensitive person said, I feel for you down there. The reflective person said, It's logical that someone would fall into this deep pit. The artistic person said, I can give you ideas how to decorate your pit. The judgmental person said, well, only bad people fall into deep pits. The analytical, the analytical person said, help me measure the depth of your pit. The curious person said, tell me how you fell into the pit. The perfectionist said, I believe you deserve your pit. The evaluator said, well, tell me, are you paying taxes on this pit? The self-pitying person said, you should have seen the pit. The specialist in meditation said, well, just relax and don't think about the pit. The, optim the optimist said, cheer up. Things could be worse. The pit could be deeper. The pessimist said, be prepared. Things will get worse. But Jesus took the man by the hand and lifted him up out of the pit and brought him to the high ground. And all around you have people giving you different opinions on life. Good, bad, ugly. But only Jesus, only God can reach down and pull us up, set us up here. Looked like Haman had won. He had the best position, the best power, the best plan. Until the story ends. This morning, life may look bad sometimes. To my friends and brothers and sisters in California, it may seem that you're here and the Hamans are here. But just hang on. Just hang on. My Bible says... That when I trust in God, I'll be able to declare all thy works. When I trust in God, I'll see the true end of the matter. And the end of the matter is, while you've set my feet on high places, theirs will be brought low. Just hang on. If you're in a bad place, time to get a different place. If you're in a bad perspective, time to change that. If you have a bad priority, 
Time to alter your priorities. Get alone and let God change you. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this truth from your word. Lord, you know that sometimes we can be in a bad place. Lord, we can see things maybe there are or aren't there. Allow our minds to wander. Lord, I pray that today our hearts and our minds and our eyes will be turned back towards you. That our trust will be back in you, Lord, that we would not measure prosperity by what we see, but by what you say it is. My friend, maybe you're here today. Maybe you are, maybe you've been in a bad place. Maybe you've allowed your mind to wander some places that don't, don't please the Lord. Would you come back to the Lord? Would you come back and put your trust in Him? Change what you're looking at. Change where you're going in your mind. You would say, Pastor, as you spoke this morning, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me? Would you pray that I put my trust, my faith back where it needs to be? Would you pray for me this morning? You would say, that's me, Pastor. Amen. 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 Hands all over. Who else? Pastor, pray for me. I wonder if you're here this morning and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You would say, Pastor, when you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Would you? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but, but I'd like to be sure about that. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. Who would say, that's me, Pastor. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll see it. Who's that? Amen, I see that hand. Who else? Amen, I see that hand. Maybe you're here online. You never trusted Christ. Just a moment, they'll put a number on the screen. Call that number. We'll have someone standing by to open up the Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Lord, I ask for your help during this invitation. Lord, those who've raised their hands, who need to turn their eyes and focus back on you, Lord, would you help them to do that? And those who've said they've never trusted you as their Savior, but would like to know, Lord, help them to come today and to find out from God's Word how they can know for sure and trust you today, Lord. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand to our feet, the altar is open. God's touched it. You come now. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open the Bible. A man, if you're a man, a lady, if you're a lady, we'd love to open the Bible and show you how you can know for sure. But you come now as God touched you. Oh, great song. The instruments are playing. I'm on the winning side. Thank you, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that we can trust in you and you're a trustworthy God. Lord, thank you that you work in all our situations as we trust you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to keep our minds focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well,